police officers of Reddit, what was your O oh moment? Story 1. Ex-cop from NSW Australian here. A guy once passed away in a motorcycle accident. We went to deliver the message to his girlfriend. After reading the collision report, the truck driver said he just pulled straight in front of him like a deliberate. She was not answering, so we forced entry. The shelves of the fridge were on the kitchen floor. Opening the fridge, we discovered multiple pillowcases with her up body inside. That was certainly a no-cow moment. Story 2. Got a call for an emotionally disturbed person. Arrive on scene and a 350 pounds man built like an NFL lineman is passed out of on the floor face down. His wife says he suffers from PTSD from the first Iraq war and that he was an army ranger. He had been drinking heavily. His son is on scene and about 16 years old. The man begins to wake up and proceeds to smash his forehead into the ground, repeatedly. We call for an ambulance. A small pool of blood begins to form on the floor. The wife grabs a rag and goes to wipe it up when this guy's head jerks up real quick, his face contorted in rage. He grabs the wife by the neck and throws her clear across the room onto the couch. We immediately jump on him, but he is preternaturally strong. There are four of us and we are each fighting one limb. The kid jumps in and helps us get two sets of cuffs on him because one set was not wide enough to connect his wrists behind his back. I ride in the ambulance to the hospital with him while he glares at me angrily, reciting his military registration number and telling me I won't get any information out of him and that I'm a towel head. I don't remotely look like I'm from the region. The entire ride, I hope that he doesn't break out of the cuffs. If I'm being honest, I'm not sure we would have gained control of him if the kid hadn't helped. Story 3. Not me, but my grandpa was on the California Highway Patrol for 20 years. He always told the story of how he pulled over this guy for a busted taillight. My grandpa asks him for his license and registration, and the guy says, How'd you catch me so fast? Grandpa said the hair on the back of his neck never again stood up half so fast. Turned out the guy had robbed a bank not five minutes before. Story 4. My older brother is a cop. He got a call about A to the Sky teenager behind a school with a knife. He rolled up to the spot, and when the kid noticed him, he immediately started hacking at his own neck with the knife. My brother sprints over to him and tases him. Save the kid's life. It's all on Body Cam Cow is flipping wild edit. A few people have asked for a link of the video. I've only seen it one time. It's not public as far as I know. This was A to the Sky teenager, so I'm sure there was good reason to not make it public. It probably would not have helped him cope with whatever was going on in his life. Story 5. I was a rookie cop in a small town. I was driving to a check on a report of a large group of kids causing a disturbance at a school parking lot late at night. I realized I had not tested my PA speaker, which I planned on using to disperse the crowd. On my way to the call, slowly rolling down a residential street at 2 a.m. with my windows down, I decide to tap my PA mic a couple times to check it. First two taps, can't tell if it's working. I slow down. I tap the mic several more times. Definitely hear the loudspeakers that time. At that moment, I hear, what the fudge are you doing? I look out my passenger window and see this old dude sitting on his porch in his underwear, looking pissed. Our eyes locked, I realized I had no decent excuse for clicking my loudspeaker in a quiet neighborhood in the middle of the night, so I didn't say anything back to him, and I floored it up the road. Definitely an oh cow moment at the time. Maybe different than what OP is looking for, but I get tired of traditional war stories. The awkward on this encounter was through the roof. Story 6. I pulled up on a teen sleeping in a vehicle at the end of a country road. When I ran the license plate, I found out that he was reported as a runaway. The doors on the vehicle were locked, so I knocked on the window to wake him up. Once he woke up and realized what was going on, he himself in the mouth with a rifle he had hidden under his blanket. Rough way to start my shift. Story 7. This happened August of last year. Was about 1, 2 in the morning when a 911 hang-up call came in where all that was heard was screaming and swearing. I was the closest unit. Riding alone as my partner had been voluntold for another assignment that set of days. So when I got out into the area, I was initially waiting for backup, however. As I was walking up to the house, I heard several voices screaming. Rushing up to the house, the first thing I noticed was blood. Everywhere. The floor, the walls, the door, all covered to shoulder height. A distraught woman screamed and pointed me towards the living room. Once I get into the living room, I see a male and female on a couch, both covered in blood. The male had a massive laceration on his right forearm and the female had taken a belt and snake, wrapped it around his arm to try and stop the bleeding. Seeing how the belt was applied, I knew it wasn't doing anything to stop the blood flow. So I pulled out my tourniquet, and as I prepped it, said to the guy, This is gonna hurt like hell, but it'll stop the bleeding. I applied the tourniquet just above the top of his bicep, and knew it was on properly when he told me his hand had started to go numb. It was at that point I noticed a second deep gash on his tricep that went down to the bone. It took EMS about 15 minutes to get to the house and the paramedic made it abundantly clear that had I not applied the tourniquet, the male would have bled out long before they were able to get there. In the end, 
Turns out the guy had come home drunk and forgot his keys, climbed up to a second-story window and punched his way into the house with near-lie results. Edit. Removed am as it was redundant. Edit 2. Apparently, tour is confusing. Story 8. Back when I was an MP, I was assigned to write up abandoned vehicles on an area on post and found a nasty one with busted-out windows, no plates, and while checking it out, noticed a couple wires running from the front to the back. A lot of phone calls above my head determined that it was an unlabeled training tool that had been left just laying out in the public by some unit on post. The next day, it had training spray painted on the side to keep anyone only from having the same moment. Story 9. Not a cop here. This is more a story of how I unintentionally gave a cop an oh cow moment. I had a night job managing a liquor store in a very bad neighborhood. It was a one-room affair with me behind a desk with the cash register just inside the store's entrance. I'd only had the job for about a month when a friend dropped by to the cow. After a bit, he asked me if the store owners had provided me with any kind of protection given what a nasty neighborhood it was. I told him, just this old double-barreled shotgun that's kept under the counter here. But it's empty. With that, I reached down and picked up the shotgun to show him. Unbeknownst to me, two armed robberies had just gone down on a fast-foot restaurant and another business close by within a couple of blocks, and the police were responding to the calls in full force. I heard the sirens but didn't think much of it because sirens were pretty common in that part of town. A police car swerved into the parking lot in front of the store, and the officer jumped out of his car and dashed in to check if the robbers weren't hitting my store too. The cop burst through the front door of the store seconds after I'd picked up the shotgun to show my friend. Him coming through the door as fast as he did startled me, and without thinking, I turned toward him with the shotgun in my hands, and it was inadvertently pointed at him. His gun was holstered and I had the drop on him. At that moment, he didn't know if I was the perp who just robbed the other stores or what. His face went paper white. Both of our minds were blown at the exact same time. I quickly laid the gun down and let him know there was no harm intended. But I'm pretty sure he's never forgotten that particular oh cow moment and neither have I. Story 10. We happened to be right on top of the scene when a carjacking with a gun call went out. I saw the car fishtailing in the snow half a block away. We started to chase, and the driver bailed immediately in the driveway of an apartment. I chased him up a hill while my partner ran around the building to him off. Just as I crested the hill, a rang out. He fired blindly behind him, the old, to whom it may concern. We chased him through a church parking lot where the bingo game was just letting out, so no return fire. Caught him in a backyard behind the church. The department gave us nice plaques. And Cake, story 11, was on a traffic stop. My sergeant came and backed me up due to having to possibly tow the vehicle. My sergeant's vehicle was behind mine and we were both in the right lane. My sergeant was sitting in his car and I exited my car to go talk to him. As I walked closer to his car, I heard a vehicle's engine rev all the way out, but I couldn't see it. For a split second, I knew what was going to happen and though oh cow but couldn't react fast enough. The vehicle I heard smashed into the back of my sergeant's SUV which struck me, throwing me into the road. The driver was completely hammered and didn't have a license. This happened last Sunday and I have surgery in a couple weeks for my knee and my sergeant has a broken back. Story 12. Dad is a newly retired cop, 30 years on the force. He has a couple gems that he has told me. Last one is pretty sad, so if you have any type of to-the-sky tendencies, consider this a trigger. 1. While working as a patrolman, he had a couple encounters with people high on PCP. The first was a lady who her entire anus out and ripped the inside part out. She woke up the next day with no recollection of what happened. She will have to be on a colostomy bag for the rest of her life, too. Another PCP story. Guy was butt in the middle of the road, sweating profusely. For those who don't know, PCP raises your body temp so people get because they are hot. The guy used a broken glass bottle to his genitalia off, balls and everything. He ended up bleeding out before EMS arrived. 3. Sad one. Thanksgiving morning, Dad worked a night shift and was home by 6 a.m. I came to the kitchen to help cook for Thanksgiving and see him staring off into space, something bothering him. Turns out there was a bad car accident and the car caught fire. The woman inside was stuck because her seatbelt had melted to her. Dad went to pull her out and described how her skin had just crisped over, so when he pulled on her to free her, the skin just kind of peeled off. They eventually got her out, but she had suffered severe burns and was permanently disfigured. Dad has ended up getting burned up pretty good too on his arms. She ended up surviving, but took her life about six months later. That one my dad couldn't really ever shape. I think he blames himself for not getting her out sooner. That kind of heartache comes with the job, I suppose. Anyway, those are some memorable stories. He's got tons more, but those three come to mind right away. Story 13. A law prof in Australia spent 20 years as a cop before becoming a lawyer and eventually teaching. In explaining the battered wife syndrome defense to murder, he told a story of a call to a little old lady's house where she had said on the phone that she had terminated her husband. 
Before this incident, he didn't really understand why it existed. Why doesn't the woman just leave? Why doesn't she just go to someone else's house? Prof shows up to the door and is greeted by a little old lady saying, Come in, would you like some tea? He goes in and she starts putting some cakes on a tray and pouring tea. He wonders if she's all there. He asks, So you said that you terminated your husband on the phone, would I be able to see him? She directs him to the living room where the old man was on a lazy boy chair, bottle in hand, and a tomahawk in his skull. Meanwhile, old lady is asking if he takes sugar or milk in his tea. The prof said at this moment he realized why the defensive battered wife existed. The drunk old guy had been beating her for years, controlled all the money and didn't let her have friends. She had nowhere to go even if she left him. So on this day, after saying he was going to beat her if his sports team lost, she took matters into her own hands. He said this was the moment he realized that sometimes there are situations where life doesn't make sense and people take the only way they can see. Story 14. Okay, I've had a few oh cow moments. I'm referred to as a cow magnet on my shift. I was working a late Super Bowl night for overtime one night. I remembered seeing a vehicle sitting in a car wash stall as I was on the way to a call. I drive back the other direction an hour later and see the same car still sitting there unwashed. There doesn't look like anyone is preparing to clean it either. It's an area of high candy activity. I pull into the parking lot and move to sneak up on the car to see what might be going on. I see a male in the back seat and he sees me. He immediately begins reach down near the seat and I'm hoping he isn't grabbing for a weapon. I draw my gun and tell him to show me his hands as I'm moving to get a better line of sight. He finally brings his hands up empty. I tell him to get out of the vehicle for me. He says he needs to pull up his pants first. I'm sorry what? He wasn't grabbing for a gun. He was trying to get the pocket cat he was using off his banana and get his pants up while I'm pointing a gun at him. I holster up and tell him to do the same. He gets out, and I can see a fairly large quantity of meth for a single person sitting in the seat next to his pocket cat and anal vibrator that I hadn't noticed before. I ask him if there's anything else in the car. He says there's some candy too and a couple dildos. He then begins begging me to throw his close relationship toys away before his wife gets there to pick up the car. Apparently, he had told her he was going to wash the car midway through the big game. He left her and their guests at his house so he could have his own special halftime show. Edit. Thanks so much for the gold. Story 15. Witness to autopsies. Watching the ME pull the testicles out from the inside. Or the needle in the eyeball to get samples of eyeball fluid. Or check welfare call. Called a check on a 50-year-old lady who hadn't been seen for a few days. Got to the apartment. Looked through a couple windows after no response at the door. Last window I checked had to try and get my bearings while looking through half-open blinds. Realized she was there in bed, eyes open. I have seen plenty of bodies prior to this call, but that one gave me the heebie-jeebies. Or another body call. Passed away in his sleep. I had been in the bedroom for a couple of hours making notifications and requests for remains removal. A belt slid off the treadmill and hit the treadmill belt pretty loudly. There was no reason for that belt to fall off that treadmill. Cops get PTSD too. Edit, cow. I have so many. Patting down a male arrestee for a female officer. Dude was passed out at a green light. He was already cuffed. Right as I got down to his right ankle, I heard it. It sounded like a garbage disposal choking on pudding. Dude cow himself right there. I didn't say anything as he sat down in the back seat. The female officer went to the opposite side of the back seat to assist in buckling him in and gagged. Oh God, what's that smell? She said. Me. He just cow himself. Lol, I was in a community policing unit. Right as me and about 25 other community policing officers got out of a meeting, a report of a homicide came out just blocks from our station. Dispatch advised we were looking for a red truck. A fellow officer called out he had a red truck nearby. I was first there as he was pulling the driver out at gunpoint. As we approached him and got him cuffed, I turned and saw the biggest traffic jam of cop cars I'd ever seen. Later that day, I watched a traffic cam recording of the traffic stop. I lost count at 53 cop cars coming to back us up. More of a holy cow than an oh cow. Story 16. Was a police intern, maybe about my second month in. I got to ride around and help with traffic stops and basically just help the officer on duty. Fairly small town, nothing ever really happened there. Mostly just drunks and domestic calls. One afternoon I was with a cop new to the force, fresh from working in the prison. Great guy anyhow, we are running a speed check on the outskirts of town and find a guy on a motorcycle speeding with no helmet. Illegal at the time. Hit the lights, pulls over with no incident. We get out. Guy doesn't even turn around. Barely answers the questions through his teeth. Back to the cruiser and run his license. Comes back with several out-of-state warrants with a bola attached due to an armed assault against a police officer. We both looked at each other and back at the dude on the motorcycle. Officer immediately unlatches the shotgun from the center console and hands it to me. If you know how to use this thing, use it. 
was all he said. Oh, cow. Without notice, other officers from surrounding towns are already lining up behind us, thank God. Dude was thankfully tired of being on the run and was ready to turn himself in. He went in without incident. Story 17. My grandfather retired from the police force a few years ago. One of his stories really stuck out to me. He answered a call, for backup, that there was a guy up in a tower shooting at cow with his rifle. When my grandpa arrived, the man at his squad car, the bullet entered the roof and hit just above his shoulder, right through the shoulder strap on his uniform. Story 18. Not me, but my brother-in-law. He gets a call that there's been an accident at a dark intersection where a lot people speed through. Arrives and finds he's the first responder, and it's a really bad collision. Finds a six-month-old infant thrown 20-plus feet from the car. Mother is. He gives CPR to the baby, but the injuries are too damaging. The baby passes away in his arms. Till today, he insists on car seats, boosters for kids until they're big enough. I don't think he's ever gotten over that baby dying. Edit. Thanks for the silver. But most importantly, put your kids in car seats and boosters. Story 19. A2, the Sky Girl was dropped off at the hospital. Myself and my colleague were there escorting another prisoner from custody. This girl came and spoke to our prisoner. They'd never before, but they were just making idle hospital waiting room chit-chat. The girl vanishes, not bothered. We don't know why she's there, who she is. We just assumed she'd gone somewhere else. After a while, our prisoner says, that girl has been in the toilet a long time. Perhaps she's having a big poo. We laugh and then realize it had been a while. So I start banging the door, no answer. Door locked. I unscrew the lock and she sat there, wheezing and not super responsive. My colleague goes for help and a nurse comes and unzips her jacket and she's made a ligature from a sock, and she's blue and not breathing. I managed to it off. It was on tight. We couldn't get scissors into it. And she's taken through to get checked, now breathing again. My partner goes with her. I'm stood by the door with my prisoner getting air. The whole thing is stressful. This happened in the middle of a busy AMPI. ER for you, Yanks. People are just looking at me. Next thing I know, a healthcare assistant is running out to me because this girl is now becoming violent, and my partner needs help. I can't leave my prisoner, and I can't leave my partner to get beat up. I chose to go for my partner. This girl is smashing her head into a wall kicking, hitting, and trying to bite. It took three of us to get her calm. I barely managed to get the assistant's shout out before going in. Radio signal is poor to non-existent. Luckily, the prisoner sat patiently in the waiting room whilst we dealt with that. They weren't cuffed, they could have ran, and there was nothing we could do to stop it. On top of all the stress that day caused, I didn't really have the oh cow moment until I was in my car on the way home and I realized a girl nearly passed away five feet away from me. I wouldn't gave known if it wasn't for the prisoner paying attention to where their new friend went. Edit. Thanks for the silver. Story 20. Late to the party. But I will say not a cop, but the victim who got to watch. I was a truck driver in my former life. Was involved in a by-truck incident where Guy terminated himself and his son. After a couple HRS, I was unhurt physically. I was in the back of a cruiser giving my statement. The MTO dot for my American neighbors rolled up at that time and got out and started taking pics of my 18-wheeler and started to do a truck inspection. The cop I was dealing with got out of his cruiser and proceeded to tear that inspector a new unpleasant person. Basically, get the hell out of my crime scene. I thanked the cop and he said he didn't know if he could actually do that, but no way was he letting Dati charge me with anything. Story 21. Had a call come out as a crash without injuries. Rolled up to the call with my partner, myself, and another unit. The guy had crashed into his own front yard, but there was no property damage. When I tried to get the guy to sign a crash statement, he told me he didn't want to and that he hadn't slept for 10 days. Then he told my partner that he had just gotten out of the hospital after an evaluation. It was cold outside, so we let him sit in the back of my buddy's cruiser while he filled out the statement of what happened. He kept making statements like, just terminate me, man, and guys just blow my head off right here. My partner called the hospital to make sure he didn't escape or something and the guy wasn't going to receive a citation at all since it was his own property that got damaged. Just a tow to his driver way, which was right there, and that's all. While walking back to the back of the cruiser to let him out, the guy pushed open the door when my partner opened it and yelled, Let's go! before attempting to tackle my partner. All three of us jumped on top of him and began trying to hold him down while he kept screaming. He then reached up and bit my partner on the arm. We got him in cuffs, then transported him to the hospital, where we had to fight with him two more times in the hospital, and he bit a nurse. Everyone was okay, and it ended up being that he was just intellectually unstable. No sweets involved. Story 22. We were looking for a guy who stole guns from his ex and found him under a pile of clothes in a closet at a different house. Unfortunately, there was like seven kids sleeping in the same room, so I start getting them out of there while my partner cuffs the guy who is pretending to sleep. We decide to drag him out, and I go to move the mattress to get it out of the way, and we find the stolen guns under where the kids were sleeping. Story 23. 
was doing a welfare check at a house for aid to the sky mail. Only person living at the house, car and driveway, and house was locked up. Gathered some more info and was told where a key was. Opened the door, announced myself, and starting searching the house, expecting to find a body. Opened a closet door, and the guy was hiding in there with a rifle next to him. If he wanted me, I wouldn't be typing this. Dude was having some issues. Sat and talked for about half an hour. Told me he heard me but didn't want to talk to anyone. Got him the help he needed. Edit. Wow, this is overwhelming. Thank you all for the responses and kind words of encouragement. I will do my best to slowly work through some of the questions I see. Story 24. My husband has been a police officer for over 20 years. One night he was patrolling the downtown area when he noticed a purse someone had left behind. He opened the bag to check for ID and found a turd. Some lady took a big peach cow in her handbag and left it behind. He'll talk about autopsies and burnt bodies, but that is the one story he would rather forget. Edit, thank you for the gold and silver. I'm so happy my husband's story made so many of you laugh. Story 25. Not me, but a drill sergeant I had in basic training. On her first shift, her first call was a mom who had gone crazy. She bit the banana off her six-year-old and used it to choke and terminate her baby. It was a total bloodbath. Edit. I don't know what happened to the banana or the mom. My DS told us this story as a, yeah, you're an MP, but you will see crazy cow type of lesson to get us to pay attention, and it worked. Edit 2. It happened in Fort Hood, Texas. Honestly, all I know about the story I what I posted above. Story 26. As a rookie, I was responding to an alarm at restaurant that was supposed to be haunted by a woman. The first officer that arrived was an older officer that didn't do much and didn't ever get excited on the radio. As soon as he arrived, he asked for a second unit in a high-pitched tone. As I pulled in, he had his shotgun out and he was leaned up over his hood. My first thought was, oh cow, someone is breaking in. When I ran up to him and asked what up, all he said was as he pulled up and his lights hit the building, a woman jumped off the roof and disappeared. He was clearly shook. Me and another officer checked the building and found no evidence that someone had been there. It made an impression on me and I never went back to the restaurant at night without another officer. Story 27. My dad was a cop for about 19 years before what would be the first time he called me after a shift. Because he felt like out of my family, I would be the only one would just listen. He got a call about a possible domestic violence out in the next county and he was the closest unit. Short story, crazy peach dad locked himself in the bathroom with his seven and three-year-old sons and terminated both sons before terminating himself. My dad got out of his car at the second and barely made it into the house at the third. He requested a transfer the next week. Story 28, former paramedic, known former gang member and seriously bad dude who was suffering from epilepsy. It was known that when he was postictal after the seizure, he would revert to his gangland days and anyone in uniform he wanted to fight. Hey look, ambulance drivers wear uniforms. Got a call to his known address. Me and my partner are first to arrive on scene. I already had the Valium and Verst drawn up and was ready to hit him with a knock-you-the-fudge-out dose. As I got to the door, his mother, a very sweet lady, was hollering, He's coming too! I jumped onto of him and with all my might held him down and rode him like I was on the Pro Bowl riding rodeo tour. My partner was able to get the meds into him IM, which takes longer to work than IV, so I had to do that for the next five to seven minutes till fire showed up. I was exhausted and not really wanting to get my peach beat rode that bull till five more guys took over. I rolled off and was just done. Three hours later, I ended up back at the hospital and he was in there. He apologized, always did, and said he never fought with anyone as tough as me. Thank God for being 40 heavier and a pocket full of mind-altering sweets. Story 29. Not me, but a guy I know. Very junior cop, he has been on the police force maybe five years now. On his very first call ever, he responded to a when he arrived, he found a 16-year-old teenage girl who had opted to end her life by slitting her own throat. First and foremost, I can't imagine what brought the girl to do this. Extremely tragic. But I also can't fathom the mental strength required to be able to continue a career in the police force after kicking things off like that. Certainly demands respect for these individuals that serve. Story 30. Responded to a welfare check called in by a social services hotline. A male had called in and said he was to the sky. They provided a name for the mail and the number he called in on. Our dispatch was able to find a previous call from that number and the address linked to it. My partner and I responded to that address and the father answered the door. We explained why we were there and asked to speak to his son. The father knocked on the son's locked door while we spoke in the hallway. I asked if he was getting dressed and we knocked again. Immediately after we heard the distinct sound of a handgun slide racking, we drew our handguns and told dad to go outside immediately. While attempting to get mom to go outside, she tried to walk down the hallway to son's door, and I had to force her out of the residence. My partner and I both took cover inside the residence and gave commands to put the gun down, telling him we just came to check on him and to talk. 30, 45 seconds into the whole ordeal, 
a single gunshot rang out from inside the bedroom. It was clear to us that he probably had himself. One, two minutes passed and we had two additional officers on scene and were able to force entry into room and found the man immediately inside the doorway. Single gunshot wound to the head. He was beyond helping. It was surreal telling the mom and dad their son was. It didn't phase the father at all. Inside his room were other spent handgun shells and holes in the wall from where he had the walls previously. He also had steak knives stabbed into the drywall. It was clear their son was disturbed and needed help, and I have no idea why the family did not seek out advice on what to do. Story 31. Not a cop, but an animal control officer. Got a call about a family dog that had been attacked an hour ago by something wild. Got there to find said family dog's skin rotting off with most of it gone and complete with maggots due to massive infection. Later found out it was from either chemical burn or boiling water poured on dog. Two weeks ago. Dog was taken to ER and youth had immediately due to only viable skin was skin on dog's head. Family still insisted it was a wild animal and it happened that night. I have no faith in humanity. Story 32. I was cleaning out a candy take back box by my office one time. It's a metal box where people throw their old prescriptions so we can dispose of them properly. Usually people throw all manner of mundane items, sunscreen, vitamins, etc., but you run into a few opioids. On this evening, I reached into the box and felt a thorn on my finger and saw an uncapped syringe. My heart dropped, and I went to the bathroom and started squeezing blood out of the pin thorn. With shaky hands, I called my dispatch and asked them to send a paramedic to the office. The medic came and consulted with the on-call doctor before she told me the chance of contracting something was very slim. I took a closer look at the syringe and saw it was someone's testosterone supplement, and it had the patient's name as well as the VA hospital name. I called down to the hospital, and thankfully the guy had no communicable diseases. Sure freaked me out, though. Story 33. When I was a trainee, we were waiting for a suspected car thief, as far as I know from the info we got from local police anyway. When he shows up and we get him stopped, we have officers approach from behind. Well, here I come with a shotgun and take up a position on the passenger side, thinking I'm being tactical by covering this angle. Well, instead of doing a textbook felony stop, which would involve taking a defensive position and ordering him to come to us with his hands up, these officers just approach the stolen vehicle from the driver's side and order him out at gunpoint. My oh cow moment was when I realized I was downrange of all these pistols and rifles, essentially looking down their barrels. To this day, I don't know if I'm dumb for being the one guy on the passenger side or if these officers are dumb for not doing a standard felony extraction. Luckily, the guy came quietly. Story 34. When I was a corrections officer, I got assigned to shadow an experienced officer until an FTO would be available to train me. It didn't take me long to find out that this CO was highly unpopular among the inmates. My moment was when we went into a 50-man dorm to do a roster bed check, and there was absolute silence in the dorm, and I could feel the hair standing on the back of my neck. The inmates were intently staring at the officer I was shadowing. He was oblivious to it while I was straight up in fight or flight mode. Never experienced that in a dorm after that. I feel like something serious was potentially going to go down that night. Two on 50 is not good odds. I couldn't have been happier when I didn't have to shadow that guy anymore. Story 35. My husband got a call for a psychiatric emergency when working as an EMT. A kid on a four-wheeler saw a pickup crashed into a stone wall in a field and called the police, who called EMS. Apparently, the driver had driven into the wall intentionally and stabbed himself in the abdomen as well, and then bled to or passed away of head injuries until someone found him. As Miso was leaning in to turn off the engine, the truck ran out of gas. That was the weirdest one he's told me. Story 36. For unattended S in my town, law enforcement is typically called in to make sure there's nothing suspicious going on before EM scoroner funeral home takeover. One day in the of summer, when it had been in the 90s for a full week, we got a call about an unattended. We get there and go into the front door, and instantly we know by the smell that this guy has been here a while and the AC is not running. It's easily 90 degrees downstairs, but he's upstairs. He is normally a pretty big guy. Stats from DMV said something like 350 pounds, if I remember correctly. But he was ballooned up from the heat and decomposition and reminded me of a gray, violet Beauregard from Willy Wonka. As they're trying to get him into the body bag, the skin starts slipping. Juices start oozing. The smell gets exponentially worse. That's about the point my sergeant decided we could wait until after the body was loaded to go back in. The image of that guy literally falling apart in the EMT's hands is something that will never leave me. Story 37. Actually, another one which is a bit creepy too. Wrote a guy a DUI one night, towed his car and seized his license, serving him with the form from the DMV, which says that his license has been seized and that he has to show up to a hearing to determine whether the license will be suspended. 
Like any good form, the DMV form has boxes where I fill out this guy's information and carbon copies so I can keep a copy with the report. A few days later, a buddy of mine finds me. He got dispatched to a call of A in the park. Man was found hanging from a tree. They identified him by the DMV form I had served him with, which was still in his pocket. Story 38. I think this counts. About nine years ago, we get a call from a payphone. There's a body in the abandoned building at Corner First and Main. Street names made up for this story. An officer responds to the area and can't find anything that would be considered an abandoned building. The caller to the sky up without leaving any information. And the payphone that he called from was several miles from that area. So the officer clears out the call having no contact. The next day, we get another phone call from another payphone. There's a body inside the abandoned building at the corner of 1st and Main. Again, they hang up without offering any other information. This time, I get dispatched the report. I head up to the area of that intersection and start looking around. Now understand that I live and work in a fairly sizable metropolitan area, and this was when the economy was still good. Booming, even. Abandoned buildings were hard to come by at that time. I drive through all the shopping plaza as a little industrial complexes within the vicinity of that intersection and I can't come up with anything. So I start driving a little bit further in each direction. But I remember that there's some new construction that hasn't been finished yet. And I wonder if they think that those are considered abandoned. I get out of my car and walk through a bunch of businesses that are still in the framing stages, but I can't find anything. As I leave the area, I'm now more than a mile from the original call location. As I pull out onto the major roadway, I stop for traffic and look in front of me. There it is, a gigantic electrical component factory that has been vacant for probably the last 15 years. It has a nine-foot wall around the entire perimeter, and the landscaping is still maintained. So it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb right away. That added to the fact that I'm pretty far away from where the caller said it should be. But then again, it's abandoned. It's definitely abandoned and has been for a very long time. So I call for another unit to back me up, and we go check it out. We use a drainage pipe to climb up and over the nine-foot wall to get inside the perimeter. We start walking the building, checking every single door. When I say this place is big, I mean it's flipping huge. It's over 100,000 FT2. It's like an old abandoned Motorola or Freescale or Intel type building. It has gigantic coolers on the outside, pipes running all over which way, ductwork running down the sides of the buildings, loading docks and a basement. Every door we come across is locked and secured. We continue walking around looking for anything out of place. As I get about three quarters of the way around the building, I pull on a door and it flings open. I called my backup who comes over to me. We knock, announce and enter the building. As we step into a hallway that leads about 100 yards down with doors on either side, the door we just stepped into closes, and it's pitch, like can't see my flipping nose on my face. We start moving through the building, trying to clear each room as the best of the two of us can. But this place is absolutely gigantic, and each room is connected to what seems like four other rooms. We stepped into one room and the door closes behind us. It must have been some old clean room or something. It was the weirdest thing because there was no sound, nothing. I couldn't hear the traffic outside or the grumble of electricity or air moving. All the sounds that we heard throughout the rest of the building were gone in this one room. When I spoke to my partner, our voices didn't even echo. It must have had some kind of sound-canceling insulation or something, but it freaked me the fudge out. The floor had random 12-inch holes in it that led down to a basement that was flooded by over six feet of water. Wire, ceiling panels, and wire jacketing were hanging from the ceiling. There was broken glass, broken pieces of metal and brick, holes in the drywall, and abandoned equipment all over. I clearly remember thinking to myself that if there ever a time that I would be attacked by skinless zombie dogs, this would be it. And the entire time we are trying to find a body. As though this cow wasn't freaky enough, I'm actively looking for a guy. We end up moving through the building, clearing it as best we can until we get to what was definitely the industrial part of the building. Gigantic boilers, evaporative coolers, and components that run the building. Oh, and spiders. A cow ton of spiders. We stepped into a room and find that it is an end. We've reached the end of the building and we don't have any further to go. The room is about 20 x 30 and contains five very large electrical cabinets. They are about eight feet tall and each about four feet wide, sitting next to each other. And they look exactly how I would design the lab of an evil genius if I had to make a sci-fi movie. The entire thing was covered in dials, levers, and red and green buttons, but only the panel in the middle was still illuminated. It had one study glowing red light on it. The first and only light I saw in that entire building. My partner calls out to me, you got anything? I replied, no, nothing in here. Looks like this was a gigantic waste of time. Just let me take a look behind these cabinets and we'll be good to head back to our cars. The panels have about 18 to 24 inches of room on each and between them and the wall and the wall behind them. I walk over to the left side and peek my head around. And bam, there he is. 
a flipping guy on the ground, pinned between the wall and the cabinet. He's on his back, arms in front of his chest like a T-Rex, and he has some injuries. And I nearly him, not gonna lie. He scared the living cow out of me. Even though I spent the last hour actively looking for him, I still wasn't completely ready for it. So skip ahead to calling detectives, etc. At the time, stripping copper was fairly new, at least to our area. I didn't recognize what the wire jacketing meant, as I hadn't seen it before. These two knuckleheads in breaking into this abandoned factory for God knows how long and systematically stripping every piece of metal out of it, and they made it all the way to the very last room, the only room that still have power running to it. See the middle panel, you controlled the fire suppression system for the building, and the owner's insurance policy required that it remained on active. When these guys opened up the panels, they must have thought they hit the mother load. Each one contained an inch and a half copper cable. Now an inch and a half copper cable is worth quite a bit of money, but it also conducts quite a bit of electricity. They threw the first one successfully, believing the sharp ends exposed inside the cabinet. But when this poor sap started into the second one, he got the right of his lifetime. Not only did he electrocute himself, but the current coursing through his arms pulled him into the cabinet, stabbing one of the exposed ends of the previous cable into his chest. This terminates the copper thief. Our tales from the squad car. Story 39. Worked with a guy who used to work for Long Beach PD. Told me a story about a call coming in that some old man had threatened his neighbor for knocking down his fence. Friend gets on scene a little late and two other units had already showed up. Friend sees crazy old guy in cuffed and in the back of one of the cars already. He thinks okay these guys got this and just wants to make sure the first units are okay. He walks up to one of the cops and notices that he has this oh cow look on his face. Cop says to friend, come with me, you have to see this cow. My friend follows the other officer into crazy old guy's garage through the house. His exact words when he told me this story was, it was like that scene in Boondock Saints where they buy the guns. The crazy old man apparently had been stockpiling weapons for the last 20 years. Multiple rifles, shotguns, pipe bombs, Semtex, various pistols, and the throne. A gas-powered lawnmower that had two M60S mounted on it. Controls for both weapons, ammo cans, etc. I'm not sure what else was on the throne, lol. Story 40. I was running a road crew clean up one day, and I had eight state inmates, and one of them picks up a loaded .38 and starts walking back towards the van. I see the gun in his hand, and say, oh fudge, they fixing to my peach. I made a cell phone call and left it on speaker, and told the inmate to place it on the ground and back up. He said, boss, I ain't gonna ya, you'd a good to all of us. And he handed me the gun. We all loaded up and went back to the prison. I'm retired from the state of Florida Dept of Corrections. Story 41. Former paramedic here. I responded to a crash on the highway that required extrication of the driver. I hop in the back seat and hold C-spine as fire starts taking off the door, posts, etc. The driver starts asking where Molly and Fred are and if they're okay. I'm confused because she was the only occupant of the car. I ask her if she's talking about the other car and she says, No, they're my pet tarantula and snake. I look in the floorboard and there are the remains of two terrariums but no Molly or Fred. Story 42. My cousin is an RCMP officer. His first posting was in a northern Saskatchewan community near the Northwest Territories. His first call was for a domestic dispute. The oh cow moment happened when they pulled up to the house. The door was open and there was blood everywhere. They entered the house to find two men arguing over a deer they terminated and who would get the bigger half. Story 43. I was watching over a guy at the hospital and all of a sudden it looks like he was fingering his unpleasant person. He then proceeds to jack off. My partner and I go in with nurses and we tell the guy to show us his hands. He pulls out one hand and it was fine. We tell him to bring out the other hand slowly and it was just covered in cow. The nurses get him cleaned up and maybe half an hour later he starts doing it again. This time we somewhat stop him in time. I asked him if he needed to go to the bathroom to which he nodded. I retrieved a nurse and they started walking to the bathroom. This man held his finger in his butthole the whole way to the bathroom but that wasn't enough of a plug so he started dropping little Hersey kisses of poops. It was later decided that he needed to go to a mental facility. P.S. He had told us he had gotten rid of a gun earlier, so that then sent a couple of our guys on a wild goose chase to find it, which they did. Story 44. Not my own story, but I used to work with a guy who was in the police, but hit burnout after seeing a lot of cow and jumped careers. He told me a story where he got a call about an apparent body in the underground. Some teenage girl had Oded on the train. But because she was propped up in her seat, Nobody noticed she was. She's been riding around the train's route for hours and, because of how impersonal we are as a society, nobody even looked in her direction and noticed she was quite clearly. He saw the security camera footage from the train and described it as like something out of a horror movie. Playing through the footage and seeing people coming on and coming off the train and fast forward, winking in and out of the, 
while she just sat there, completely motionless, as the clock zoomed through hours of video, and nobody realizing they were sharing the carriage with a corpse. Story 46. Paramedic here, not an officer. But I probably know this one officer's oh cow moment. Went on a psychiatric call out in the rural area of our zone. Ended up being a hanging. Super eerie vibe. It was dusk out, cool fall breeze, remote house with a single tree in front of it, and nothing around for miles. House had a very long, very steep driveway. As you drive up, you see the silhouette of a man hanging from the tree. Looked like Halloween decoration. I was first on scene and advised our dispatch of what I had. We used separate dispatches from the sheriff's department, and he hadn't received the update yet. He rolls up and quite literally says Jesus flipping Christ. Rookie deputy, he's actually a good friend of mine. One of the things I would never, ever recommend one to see in person. So surreal, lifeless body just swaying in the wind. Story 47. I was a SRO, school resource officer, assigned to a middle school. I get called into a meeting with the vice principal, a 13-wire old male, and mom and grandma. Mom says that someone attacked her son and letters on her kid's left hand. I observe the hand and it's pretty nasty. The kid tells me a story that does not make any sense. Gives me a name of the supposed suspect and get them out of class. I have described the suspect and doesn't match. The whole time the kid was wearing a jacket and being in Texas, it was weird to me that he had it on. I asked him to take it off and see that he he whole left arm up. He the name of a girl and asked who if she was his girlfriend, and he replied no. I speak to the girl and she says she has never spoken to him. Turns out the male kid was off his psych meds and had a history of mental issues. Creeped the hell out of me.